Uh, thank you for coming. Today's present today's presenter is uh, Agos Solnaregut, who is about finishing uh, his PhD at uh, CU, and he will uh, present uh, his uh, job market paper. So that's why uh, the today's uh, presentation will be in English and the theory source. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a great, a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as Balash said, this is my job market paper. So feel free, feel free to give me any harsh comments or feedbacks. Uh, all of them are back. Uh, okay. Well, start. Mm -hmm. Start on the <laughs> Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so this is my job market paper. Uh, if I can add to you that this is uh, rather an econometric theory paper, uh, but I uh, try to, to give you a tool uh, that actually uh, you can use in your uh, research if you are uh, in an RD uh, design, which means regression design. To design. So I hope I can uh, share you uh, the, the results and uh, the, the great tool uh, that if you have an RBD and you would like to do a heterogeneity analysis uh, or robustness check, uh, that this is uh, the tool to use. Uh, so this paper will to discover heterogeneity treatment effects in RBD, where this heterogeneity is captured by conditioning uh, treatment effects on values of covariates. So we have a bunch of covariates and using these to identify this heterogeneity. The paper shows how and why machine learning algorithm can suit for this purpose. And I'm showing you some Monte Carlo simulation to support my claims that this is not just asymptotically useful, you know, when you have a bunch of data, uh, but also when you have considerable amount of data that use this. And in the end, I would like to give you a demonstration uh, on the, with an empirical application and actually what are the benefits of using this tool. Sure. Yes. So you want to learn uh, on So you want to, you want to discover on the right? Indeed, that's, that's the case. And uh, I'm very to explain that I have uh, many candidates uh, possible source of heterogeneity and I would like to, to discover this. Okay, so let me just give you a short introduction. What is uh, RDD? So my leading example is going to be the following. Uh, we are interested in the baccalaureate test score uh, if you are getting uh, to a better school. Uh, let's say the running variable x with the score distance from the cutoff. If you are above the zero or above the cutoff, then you're getting admitted to the school. If you are below, then you're not getting to the better school. The outcome variable is uh, the grade in the baccalaureate test score and the average treatment effect, as I'm pretty sure all of you know, that is the treatment effect, the jump in the conditional expectation function around uh, the uh, cutoff value. Now, the identification hinges on that the students above and below this cutoff. Uh, are pretty much similar. So this is the local randomization argument. In uh, theory, you will need that the conditional expectation function for treated and non-treated units are continuous around the threshold. Now, uh, to motivate my paper, uh, that in many cases, a researcher or policy maker is not only interested in the average uh, overall treatment effect, but how this treatment is affects uh, different groups to understand the diversity of, of the population. Or maybe if you are a policymaker, you would like to know which groups had the largest or the smallest uh, treatment effect, because under some uh, circumstances, uh, the next policy intervention can be more efficient uh, and targeted for this uh, group. <coughs> or if you are writing the paper, then you can just, okay, you know, the editor is always asking for uh, so robustness checks or heterogeneity analysis. And this is uh, uh, 
standardized way to do uh, heterogeneity analysis, uh, and it is uh, pretty much replicable. Now, uh, when this method works really well is when uh, groups are defined in terms of uh, pretreatment covariates, that's called Z. And the treatment can be highly nonlinear function in, in Z. And these different covariates may interact uh, with each other. So, for example, it's really hard to just you know, come up with a group uh, with certain age cohort, with uh, gender of being female, male, uh, having some kind of disabilities or, 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 uh, or so. And, uh, and you know, when these different covariates interact with each other, the possible uh, interactions just so I'm proposing uh, this continuity tree algorithm. This is how I call my algorithm to automatically discover these unknown truths. And let me continue my example. So we have this classical standard uh, RDD. And if I'm throwing in uh, many covariates, then I can identify it now just like pick out two groups. Uh, <laughs> Group is defined where uh, the student has low peer quality uh, peers. Then you can see that uh, it has a different regression line. And actually, they are interested in the, in the uh, jump, and the magnitude of the jump in this uh, regression uh, are different than for the high peer quality uh, group. And from this small exercise or demonstration, we can say that uh, for high peer quality. Uh, students uh, so in school where, where the high uh, the, the peer quality is high you will face an even larger treatment effect when you are going to the baccalaureate test later i'm going to show more detailed uh, results of this topic now let me just outline the method how it goes to give you a big picture and then i'm going to uh, show you some formulas as well so what the paper actually does, it creates many uh, candidate groups uh, based on pretreatment variable, for example, low versus high peer quality, male versus female, or the interaction of these. It's going to estimate the average treatment effect within uh, this group. I'm going to use a simple parametric uh, RDD, so basically using OLS. And uh, then, based on the novel criteria, that is basically the main value added of this paper, I'm going to build an algorithm which decides whether this candidate group is relevant or not. And uh, if you are more or less familiar with the machine learning algorithm uh, with causal uh, treatment effects, then I'm going to use this honest approach to avoid invalidating the groups. Okay, so my paper talks to two literatures. Uh, the first one is the RD literature, and it's a booming literature. So many, many papers uh, nowadays coming out uh, in, in this field. And the paper uh, focuses on the classical RD setup. So we have one running variable with a known threshold value uh, for the assignment mechanism. And I'm proposing an estimator for the conditional average treatment effect, where this k function. Uh, has many candidate conditioning variables uh, with possible interactions, and the functional form can be uh, nonlinear or unknown. And there is a great paper by Su and Chen uh, who proposes a test for heterogeneity, whether there is additional heterogeneity in the treatment effect or not, uh, but it does not uh, address the question okay, there is heterogeneity, but, but from which sources uh, this heterogeneity? Okay, the other literature is the machine learning literature and uh, many, many uh, recent developments uh, in this field. Uh, top journals are, are, are publishing uh, lots of machine learning methods uh, with uh, the potential outcome framework. Uh, and this paper adds a specialized method uh, to the causal regression tree literature. Uh, I'm extending the methodology proposed by Edgar Evans uh, to the RD setup. Uh, and if you are more or less familiar with this literature, the main idea is uh, to use leaf by leaf regression instead of calculating simple means. I'm going to discuss it a bit more in detail and tailoring the algorithm to the specifics of the RD. 
Now, one may argue that, okay, but I understand there is many uh, recent developments, many useful of the shaft causal machine learning method. And I would argue that this is true, but there is no a specified method for RDD. And because RDD utilizes this really special uh, identification structure or identification idea, uh, then it can utilize the information or the restrictions it uses. Okay, so if I would just only grab and use uh, off the shelf causal machine learning algorithm, then I would impose too much restriction. And I would argue that this is not necessary. And this paper actually provides a very standardized uh, method of identification of this heterogeneous treatment method. Now, there is two closely related papers that I would like to uh, talk about. The first one is by Atti Putriani and Nader. Uh, this is a great paper uh, focusing on generalized random forest. So, basically, what they've done is proposing a general framework. Uh, with local conditional moments. And if you are working out the conditions uh, for this method, then this can be seen as a specialized version of their paper. So they give, give us a really broad tool. However, the, the special uh, uh, assumptions uh, are not worked out uh, for RDD. So my paper can be seen from this perspective. And there is another paper by Ryan, uh, his co-authors, which is called Movement for us. This is a working paper. This is also a really nice uh, paper, but I would say that this is in a, in a quite early stage. Uh, and this also provides a general tool where RDD can also fit in. Uh, but I argue that uh, my method is, is, let's say, again, a worked out special case in one sense, uh, another sense that they use an example uh, RDD as well. However, in their application, they are using a really restrictive method. Can I ask a big, big, big picture question? Sure. So, uh, if, uh, in your uh, examples, uh, you were uh, interested uh, whether uh, uh, the treatment effect differs uh, um, between a specific groups, which we can observe. Uh, you can define whether somebody has a better or worse uh, peer, group, uh, peer groups, or you observe uh, gender. But why is not uh, enough just uh, separating the sample and uh, redoing the analysis on, on this uh, sample and so checking uh, whether uh, the estimated parameters are different from each other or not? Great question. So I would argue that uh, if you are just doing the separation by hand, uh, then you will end up with the problem of multiple hypothesis testing, right? So you are just digging in your data and then you are invalidating the inference. So you will find groups which you think is relevant, but in fact is not relevant, but you just get, uh, you know, lucky out of five percent out of 100. So this is a systematic way to do this. And, and related to this, what, what if you perform a standard cluster analysis before running your regressions to identify the groups and then do what Balash suggested? So then uh, that, that's also a nice uh, question. So the first problem is uh, related to, to uh, distorting its inference. So I'm going to use and say and elaborate on what is an uh, honest uh, approach. Uh, this is going to restore uh, the, the, uh, the probable, uh, the, the right uh, parameter estimates <coughs> and standard errors, right? Uh, however, if you are just using one sample, then the same uh, problem applies. So you are going to distort your, uh, your uh, results uh, using, for example, uh, cluster analysis. I would argue as well that, okay, but with which objective you are going to do the clustering. And then uh, you would like to focus on the treatment effect. And uh, I don't know any of, of these clustering methods that would uh, part of, uh, anticipate this uh, way of clustering. Okay, so this question. So I, I got to start your basic question. So are you interested in, in estimating the heterogeneous effects that you are interested in figuring out these heterogeneities? Or you, you are rather interested in the average effect if there are heterogeneities in the background? Do you understand 
Yeah, yeah, so uh, no, the first one, I'm interested in the heterogeneous treatment effect. So I would like to know which groups are relevant and what is the treatment effect for that group? That's my question. So I just puzzle. Usually, party, I think, the, the causal inference is theory driven, and you want to see what causes what. On the other hand, machine learning is typically a discovery. Now, you're merging these two, and I, yeah. You know, you're finding causal effect by chance or by fluid. So actually, the, the causal effect must be there. So if there is an overall average treatment effect, then you can do the heterogeneous analysis. That's the first step. There is some rare cases where, you know, the, the overall average treatment effect is zero, but you can find uh, you know, heterogeneous uh, treatment effects. But this is the similar, like, you know, you are putting your hands into a really warm, very warm, right? Um, so in that sense, this can come up. And you are right, uh, this is going to be a data-driven method. Uh, however, the even identification is coming from the, the theory, the theoretical point of view. So actually this is right, uh, merging of, of these two, but if the identification is invalid, then what you are going to find is invalid as well. This is like a uh, wonder from the theoretical point. Okay, uh, so let me just uh, specify a bit more in detail what is uh, regression discontinuity. I'm going to only focus on sharp uh, RD uh, today. That's uh, because of its simplicity. So let's say we have an outcome Y and we have the treatment effect D. And uh, if you are getting the treatment, so D equals to one, then you have uh, the potential outcome Y1. If you are not getting the treatment, you have Y0. Now, getting the treatment effect is, uh, depends only on the running variables. So before in our example, if you're above uh, cutoff value, then you are getting the treatment, you can get to the better school. If you're below, then uh, you are not getting the treatment. My goal is to estimate the condition average treatment effect. And now this is going to be a little bit more interesting in this context. So this is the classic of uh, treatment effect, the expected value of it. And now the identification comes here. So we have to be around or actually at the cutoff value. And that we are conditioning all different uh, covariates. So that's, that's the idea. And let me just uh, relate this method to other uh, machine learning methods. So for example, if you have a simple experimental design or uh, observational study with uncompoundedness uh, analysis, uh, then you are going to have a much more simpler way and I'm going to show what's the connection between RD and M. So the potential outcome, you get the treatment, uh, what is your outcome is nothing but uh, if you are not getting the treatment plus the effect of, of the treatment, which now depends on the observable and unobservable characteristics. Now this uh, Kate function is then is going to be a weighted average of these treatment effects and the weights are the probability of you have the unobserved variable u given your observed variable and this fraction. And if you are in just a simple experimental design, this is just one, okay? So it's, it's, it's not existent. So what is this fraction? What is this animal? Actually, this is the x and the probability of you having characteristics of u and z, and you are going to be around the cutoff value or actually at the cutoff. So basically here, what I'm asking that, okay, you have these characteristics. So for example, you are a young Romanian uh, male student in uh, Kolozhva. What's the probability of you getting around uh, the threshold value where you get admitted or just not getting admitted to uh, the better school? Okay, actually this fraction is going to give this x the probability. Now, of course, the main problem is that u is unobserved. So this value is unobserved. However, when you are interpreting this k function, you have to take into consideration that this is a weighted average of the unobserved variables. 
And if this is equal to one, then this is the classical pink function. Now, let me uh, be, a, be a bit more specific. So uh, we have been talking about identifying groups. And actually, I'm going to use regression trees, which is uh, which provides a, a simple and easy to interpret form. So we have this tree, tree structure here. And let's say we are noting with uh, this tree structure with pi. Uh, capital Z is that we don't split our sample. So we have all the observation in one group. Now then let's split our sample into two groups. The first group is the low peer quality group. And we have a treatment effect tau one for this specific group. And if we are checking the other group, then we have a different treatment effect. So basically, this is how we specify our groups. And just note that these are mutually exclusive partitions of the overhead space. Okay. So this group treatment effect is defined by this uh, formula where we now not specifying each values of the covariate space, but rather specifying groups. And now the condition average treatment effect is going to be the sum of these. Okay. So we can take all the groups individually, and that's going to be the overall k function. Now, what happens if actually the, 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 the k is a continuous function? Then this is going to be a step approximation. So let's say that. Uh, for example, the, the treatment effect is varying with age linearly, then it's going to be only just a step uh, approximation and taking all cohorts the, the expected value. Yes? So you're, so, you're, okay, 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 okay. so you're splitting on the tau on the treatment? Yes, based on the treatment effect. I would like to get this. And I'm going to show and tell you why. Uh, why this tau? But actually, what, what I'm splitting is based on the, the pretreatment uh, covariance. So, what is your age? Whether you are uh, uh, below age 30, then you are going to belong to this group. If you're above age 30, you belong to this group. So, this is just an example. Uh, and this is actually the case of, you know, having a zero overall average treatment effect. But if I can specify the two different groups, then it turns out one of them has plus one, the other one has minus one treatment effect. And I would argue that, you know, if, if I wouldn't highlight, highlight these two different groups, then at least me, I wouldn't recognize there is two different treatment effects. And my method is going to, to discover these two different groups. Okay, and now coming back to the identification assumption, I'm not going to go into details that you, you, you should know is that this method works. So identification of the treatment effect holds if all the, ident the classical identification assumption holds for each group. Okay. So now it's, it's, it's rather a theoretical point and it's a good question if you are estimating the average treatment effect. Uh, then it should be valid for each groups because if one of the group valid, uh, invalidates the, the assumptions, then it's going to bias the average treatment effect as well. But let's say that all the groups satisfy the assumptions, then you are safe and you are good to go and use this method. Okay. Uh, in this paper, I'm using a parametric polynomial estimator. So Let's say that the treatment, uh, the tree structure, uh, this pi is given, and then I'm going to estimate the peak order polynomial in X using OLS. So actually, okay, if we have a uh, high pure quality group, group, then I'm going to estimate the first or a pi, uh, fixed order uh, polynomial there. And this is how I'm going to estimate this alpha, which is the, the intercept and the cutoff value. Okay, and this is nothing but the treatment effects for each of the groups here, uh, where this alpha is below or above the threshold for winters. Okay, so until now, I assume that the tree was given. Uh, and now I would like to decide which tree is optimal or which tree would I say that, okay, this is my favorite or best tree according to my favorite uh, criterion. 
Uh, and I'm going to argue that this criterion is actually useful. However, before I'm going to relate to how not to screw up with multiple testing. Uh, so preserve uh, correct inference. And this is the honest approach. The honest approach is going to split the sample to two parts. And then basically the general idea is that use one sample to create the tree structure. And let's assume that this is okay. And then use this tree structure on a different sample and estimate the parameters. And because they are uh, IID uh, values, uh, they dependent from each other, then given the tree structure, you can safely estimate the treatment effects with safe uh, standard errors. That's, that's the general idea. And the final question is, how can I evaluate my uh, algorithm? And I would argue that, okay, give me a test sample. And I would like to build a tree that is going to give you the most optimal value according to our favorite uh, criteria. Okay, so what you have to keep in mind, we have in theory three different samples. One is the training sample where we find an estimated treatment. We have an estimation sample, which is logged away and going to be used only in the last step. And in theory, we have a test sample that we would like to have the best properties of this algorithm. Uh, my favorite familiarity with that is a uh, tree building, but I do not understand that the difference between the training and the estimation sample. Mm -hmm. So the training sample is used to, okay, where should I split my sample? Should I split it to female and male, uh, and then with male to young and old, and so on. But if you are using the splits, then uh, of course you are going to tend to choose splits, which gives you the best criteria. Right now, it might be the case that this is just out of luck, and we would like to avoid that. And this is why we are using training and estimation sample. How do you estimate? Okay, you put them uh, in different samples, so you would like to see large differences between uh, the subject. Just in a second, that I'm going to show. Okay, so let me show the criteria. So actually, this is simple mean squared error. And I would like to uh, show you that this has actually nice properties. So we would accept the mean squared error is a fairly good uh, measure of, of uh, having the best uh, fit. We have the Kate function, the true Kate function, and we have our estimated Kate function. We have the ZI values, which coming from your favorite test sample. So you give me a test sample and you ask me that I wish that I would like to create a tree which is going to perform the best in, in my test sample. We have the tree structure and we estimate the tree plant effects in the estimation sample. And we would like to minimize the square of this. Okay. First now, just let, let's neglect this, uh, this, this little part. This is just a scalar. So this is just you know, number five or something like that. Now, the main problem is that we don't know what is the true cage function, right? If we would know that, there would be no question. So the, the solution to, to solve this problem is used instead the expected mean square criteria. What does it tell me? You, you can give me a test sample. I cannot guarantee you that I'm going to give you the best tree for that particular sample. But if you throw me a bunch of sam test samples, then on average, I'm going to perform very well. Okay. So that's the idea that now we are going to calculate the expected mean squared error. And actually this is really useful to finally calculate and here comes the theory and a lot of derivations come in and we are going to end up with this uh, estimable and feasible criteria. Okay, so how this criterion works. So let's say we have two candidate trees. Let's say that I just get it. The first is just really simple. We have one over average treatment effect. We have all the covariance in, in that node. The second tree, we have a split. So we have two groups. Both of them have equal probabilities, one half, one half. The first one has treatment uh, effect three, and the other one treatment effect two. Now the second part is going to calculate the expected square 
of the treatment effects. But here I just calculate these terms. This is nothing but one times one to the power of two. This is just one. However, note that this is, if you just calculate the overall average treatment effect, this is the same, so this is one. However, if you split it into two uh, parts, then this criterion is going to be large, or actually larger than one. Okay, so what it tells us, this is going to drive uh, the, the exploration. It's going to split the samples to more and more and smaller and smaller groups. And the treatment fx square is going to always increase. Okay. Now, this is going to lead us to a problem which is called overfitting uh, that I'm going to address with, with uh, specific tools. Okay. So, this is the part of the criteria which is going to lead the exploration. The second one is controlling for variation. And this uh, expression is nothing but the expected value of the variance estimators. Okay, so let's continue with candidate uh, three, two. And now we are going to address the variance for this treatment effect one and treatment effect two. Okay, let's say this first one is one, the second one is 0.5. Just for illustrative purposes, let's say that we have 500 observations here and 500 observations here. And we can calculate the average uh, of these variances, which is 0.75. Now, if we split this second node to two further parts, then let's say the probability is going to be one quarter, one quarter. And now the variance is increasing because we have less observation in that, uh, that specific group. Okay? So because the variance is increasing, then this value is going to be again larger. However, we would like to minimize this expression. Therefore, we split the groups to two further we split the leaf two to two further groups. However, we increase the variance. We are not so precise about our treatment uh, effect estimator for that specific group, and this is not good. So this is the general idea, okay? In one part, we would like to increase and explore as much heterogeneity as possible. But on the other hand, if we are creating smaller and smaller groups, they are going to be more and more uncertain about our treatment effects. And actually, this is the contribution of the paper uh, that's a feasible estimator for the EMLC criterion. And this is the actual two parts. So this is within the exploration. This is the variance part. I don't want to go really much into details, but here where it comes from uh, in the, the parametric RDD. So actually, uh, this sigma and m are similar uh, estimators for the uh, variance of the treatment effects in the parametric uh, setup. Okay. So that would be the criteria. And now I would like to finalize how, how this tree is built. So, first, we split our initial sample. So, that if you have your, your data, you will have a training as an estimation sample. Most probably, you are going to split it by one half and one half. Then, you are going to use your training sample and use this EMSC criterion to build this uh, tree. It's going to be a really large and uh, overfitted tree. And then, in the next step, we would like to control for this. And this is actually using cross validation with weakest link, uh, link pruning. And this is the weakest link pruning. So, the more deep your tree, so more and more group you have, this criteria is going to be penalized by this number of, of, of final groups. And with the cross validation, you can estimate the optimal pruning parameter. This is actually pretty standard in machine learning. So there is no new MC method here. Okay, and the, of course the final step is now we have our optimal tree. And in this optimal tree, now I can use my log the way sample, estimation sample, and calculate my treatment effects safely. Okay, uh, are these specific details? 
So in RDD, we usually use local polynomial estimators, uh, and there is a bandwidth selection. In this paper, uh, we are not using bandwidth selection, so this uses only parametric RD. Actually, now uh, we are working on an extension for, for bandwidth selection as well, but in this current uh, paper, there is none. Uh, however, in practice, if you have a considerable amount of non-linearity in the data, I encourage you to restrict your initial sample to uh, your favorite uh, RD optimal method. Okay, the other issue is selecting the order of polynomials. This, this was not really much addressed in the literature. Uh, however, nowadays, uh, so uh, in the last two years, there is two papers in the, in the topic and Inbans and, uh, and Weber, they both have one of the papers on this. Uh, when they even use local polynomial estimator, they are thinking about, okay, which order they should, should be used. Uh, and my paper actually talks to this literature as well because you can use this EMSC uh, criteria to build in the, in the selection of order of polynomials as well. Okay, let me show you some Monte Carlo results. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to show you some of the kind of evidence for that. Yeah, that's that's an interesting part. Yeah. There's one thing that I still don't really understand. So, in my understanding, in when we build these trees, we need to um, so in the first uh, leaf, we have to find a characteristics with a characteristic. Uh, which divides the sample into two parts, uh, and you want to you want to find uh, this by maximizing the the difference between the total uh, that you measure in the two subsamples, right? And you do it not quite. So not only so so we are going to use the EMSC function for that as well. So not only just maximizing the square root Yeah, okay. But, but, still, but still, it's, um, so when you, were, when you were talking about the multiple hypothesis testing, I was thinking, oh, wow, you don't need to run so many regressions that calculate so many tiles to, to find these heterogeneities. And I, then I, I'm just thinking that, yes, you yeah, have you to. You have to, yeah. yeah. You have to, you do have to. And, and you're not solving the multiple hypothesis problem by, the tree, but you solve it by using the training and the uh, and the test samples. And so my question is the following: If I if I'm just uh, if I'm just having such a problem, and I divide my sample into two, and do all run all my very simple RDD uh, regressions on one sample, find which heterogeneities are the most important, just by observing, and then uh, and then use the, the other uh, sample to uh, to find the, the, the correct standard errors. Can I do that? And will they be okay? So actually, that's that's the general idea. Yeah, yeah. so you are absolutely correct. Yeah. Of course, it comes with the cost that you know you are splitting your sample. Therefore, your standard errors are not going to be so small as you would run in the in the large. But you know you are not making mistakes. Great. Okay, uh, so let me just give you a, a, a Monte Carlo uh, setup. So here I'm just going to show you three simple, let's say simple setup. Uh, there are some continuous simulations in the paper as well. Uh, so the first one is pretty much what I have already shown you. Uh, we have a linear conditional expectation function, two binary Z's. One of them is relevant, the other one is not. Uh, and the treatment effect is minus or plus one. The second one and the third one is coming from the Kalanico et al. Uh, paper. This is a seminal paper on RDD and robust uh, estimation. Um, and actually, we have a quite nonlinear conditional expectation function. For DGP2, we have two treatment effects, which are not so large. 
Actually, this is good because if it's uh, uh, the job market talking will be online, there will be a pretty short sure some uh, uh, problems with the connection. So this is good training for that as well. Okay, so uh, that's the DGP2. Actually, now I'm just changing that. Okay, instead of linear, we are going to use a non-linear conditional expectation function. And I just a little bit spice up so instead of two now we have uh, 52 uh, binary variables only one is relevant the others are not and finally i would like to protect against finding false groups so here we have a homogeneous treatment effect nonlinear uh, conditional expectation function and again a lot of uh, candidate variables okay so i'm showing you different uh, sample sizes uh, the sample size, so if I'm saying that we have 1,000 observations, then in your training sample, you will have 500, and in your estimation, you will uh, have 500 as well, and using 1,000 uh, Monte Carlo repetition. And uh, for DGP1, just a simple linear regression, and four and uh, three are going to use a fixed order polynomial. Okay. And the variation only comes from the disturbance term. And uh, the first column is showing you the infeasible mean squared error. So this is demonstrating that the EMSC function uh, that I'm going to uh, that I'm using in this algorithm is actually minimizing the infeasible mean squared error as well. So this is a quite good proxy for this latent and, and uh, ideal criteria. The second one is the average number of leaps. And in the first and the second DGP, we have uh, two treatment effects, therefore two leaves. But it can be the case that, okay, I have found two leaves, but the splitting was not to the relevant, but to an irrelevant variable. So therefore I'm going to check the DGP found, whether actually we have found the true DGP. It works if we have a nice tree structure. If it's a continuous case, then it's of course doesn't work. Now, the big message of, of this exercise is that it works fairly well. However, if there is a considerable non-linearity in your uh, expectation function, then this method is not going to, uh, to, to get your true DGP, but rather only the, the overall treatment effect. Okay? So back to your question, if you have small or moderate sample size uh, and with lots of, of, of non-linearity in the data, uh, that it's not going to work that uh, on But on the, all the, all, on the other cases, it works pretty well. Okay, I also, yeah. I have a question. I do not understand uh, why uh, uh, it worked uh, better uh, in two of the three cases if uh, the sample size was very small. I would expect that. Uh, where? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, in the first and uh, third uh, uh, DGP and the sample size was 1000 uh, per, uh, worked perfectly, while uh, if the sample size was 10 times as large, then the success rate was uh, lower than 4%. Excellent question. So actually, uh, if DGP found, <laughs> But I have a question. I haven't touched that, so, but whatever. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so you are right. Uh, and if we are in a, a statistical inference course, and this model of discovery would be exactly the same as the standard errors and, errors and so on, then it should give us 95%, right? Uh, more or less. So actually, here you can see that this is 100% because it's all, all uh, always overproof. So there is no enough uh, proof or data to split the samples. And luckily, later on, neither. Only 
you know, three times out of 100, it's going to discover some false and irrelevant groups. However, it just shows you that it, when it's, it's found the DGP 100 times, uh, then, then it's going to be pruning more aggressively back. That's the goal. But that's, that's actually really nice that uh, it's not going to prune even better back when if there is existing heterogeneity in your data. Okay, the next table uh, is uh, the you really want uh, ruin the uh, uh, the inference for the treatment effects. So actually, uh, bias is actually just going to show you the, the bias, uh, the Monte Carlo average bias. The second one is the 95% uh, confidence interval of coverage that we are more interested. So even we have found the true BGP, uh, we estimate the treatment effect in our estimation sample, and it would be curious whether we not only find the true treatment effect, but we can use the standard errors for, uh, for uh, hypothesis testing. And actually, it, it, it gives back the, uh, the, the true uh, coverage uh, intervals pretty well. And actually, this is, this is really important because if you are just using uh, machine learning methods for predictions, uh, but you are going to use this predictive machine learning algorithm to, to get a, a parameter, for example, a simple loss. Then you, you probably have experienced that not only your variable selected is going to be really hectic, but your parameter is going to be hectic as well. Okay, so this is actually not so straightforward that these are correct. I'm sorry, I remember correctly that the uh, true tau does about uh, 0.2. And the uh, BS should be, uh, it's a uh, 50 or uh, how much uh, smaller. So uh, the suggestion is just I normalize the tau to zero to P1 because uh, it's really hard to understand by this uh, point of three zero. Um, that's a, a very important point. Now let me move on to the application. Uh, so we uh, use the Popakas and Urkula uh, paper and actually their data, uh, and they investigate uh, the effect of going to a better school in Romania uh, school system between uh, 2003 and 2007. Now the main uh, pillars are elementary school students takes a national wide uh, test in the last year of. Uh, school and applies to a list of high schools and the admission decision depends uh, on the student's performance on this test and on the preference of the schools and i'm going to show you two uh, exercises the first one is uh, the robustness check for heterogeneity analysis uh, that they are doing and i'm going to compare that their ad hoc heterogeneity analysis versus my method and the second one is using the survey data set where I would like to show that if you have many covariates, how my algorithm works. Uh, the results uh, refer to the intent of treatment effects, and this is how you should think about it, uh, the results. And the first exercise, uh, we have the outcome, the grade score of the baccalaureate test. Uh, we have the running variable, which is the score on the eighth grade test. And we have two sources of heterogeneity. The first one is the average transition score for the class. So you write the national test, and then you are going to calculate the average for that particular class. And the second one is the number of schools in town, whether in your school you have two, three, four, or more uh, classes. The cutoff uh, might be different, and actually they are different depending on the school, of course. Uh, however, I'm going to use the same method uh, as in the paper, uh, so uh, use the distance from the cutoff and uh, using the school year fixed effects uh, when calculating. Now Popakas and Urkelo uh, uses ad hoc groups. So actually they checked what happens if you calculate the treatment effects uh, for the top and for the bottom tertiary groups according to the average transition score. And also they check the treatment effects for uh, for 
towns with two schools or three schools or four schools and uh, more. Okay, that's, that's the idea. Now I'm going to use all of these variables uh, and run my algorithm basically. And in this case, uh, even with, with uh, more than uh, one half million data, uh, the result is more simple, simple. And this is actually the graph that I showed you that is going to uh, split along the average transition score for the class. And actually this splitting value, which is just 7.64 is around the 40 fifth uh, person. So basically below the median or above the median, uh, you are going to face uh, different treatment effects in the uh, grade in your baccalaureate test score. And the number of school was not relevant. Okay, so actually in this case, it is going to show you that if you are using this uh, method, you will find a pretty simple uh, treatment effect at the urgent in this case. Uh, the exercise, the second exercise is going to explore the heterogeneity, the peer quality effect, and uh, it uses a survey data set. It's much moderate, so it's only 11,000 uh, observations. Uh, the outcome is the student peer quality, which is measured as the average test score uh, of the admitted students within the school. And there is 32 uh, potential variables. Uh, socioeconomic factors, uh, school characteristics, and study behavior uh, variables. So we actually throw in a bunch of, of these variables, but we have to be uh, really careful is that all of these variables should be pre-treatment variables. It does not have an effect on uh, whether admitted to the school or not, but actually uh, if these do not have direct Okay, so the result is this tree, and actually, this what uh, I would like to show you that if you are using my algorithm, you, you can expect uh, similar outputs. So you can estimate the overall average treatment effect, which is on the top, uh, which is around 0.4 uh, to 6. To put it into uh, perspective, this goes from uh, 0 to 10. So 0.5 uh, is not super large, but considerable size of, of uh, treatment effect. Now there is a difference between, uh, now we have only pounds where there is two schools in town or three schools in town. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so what's, what's the treatment effect? So actually it's going to ask if you are admitted to a better school, then you can experience uh, a, a better peer quality environment. So your peers are going to be uh, comparatively better than if you would not get admitted to the school. And peer quality is measured as the, the average. Yes. <laughs> so, so you were mentioning uh, a few minutes ago that you look at patterns ratings based on covariates uh, before treatment. Yes. So peer quality. You now you mentioned that peer quality is after. Now I'm going to use this as uh, uh, our outcome. This is yeah. a different sure. example. So yeah, this is this is a second. This is exercise two. Sorry, yes. So I, I haven't yes. I, I emphasized that enough. So that was the end of the first and robustness check. And in the second one, um, this is basically because we don't have uh, pretty good data. Uh, so we have different data sets. One is really large, but few covariates. And this is the second data set where we don't have our baccalaureate test score, that would be the best to have in this, but we don't. And we, on the other side, we have a lot of covariates. This is the same. What's the question here with the running variables of the cutoff phase? You don't like it. Okay, so you are absolutely right. I, I will stop it there. So the outcome is here on the other side. 
on the same thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we have a much richer set of, of Z's. That's, that's the point. Uh, I guess. Uh, going back to the results. Uh, so now we have a much more limited uh, data. We have only uh, two schools in town or three schools in town. So these are uh, the two uh, possibilities. Uh, and we can see that uh, the treatment effect is a little bit higher for, uh, for students who are in a uh, city or in a town with only two schools uh, and a little bit less where there is three schools. Uh, the others, so this branch is really interesting, but I wouldn't bet my career on it. Uh, so this uh, is not super significant uh, in, the, in the results, but I would like to, to show you that these are the, the nonlinear groups that the, the algorithm can create. The other branch that I would like to talk about a little bit uh, is that it splits uh, the, the sample uh, to two parts. So we have students uh, who are in towns with uh, three schools, and we have students uh, without internet and with internet. It doesn't really make sense to split this because the treatment effects is actually the same. However, after, for students who has internet access, but there is a big difference. And actually, this big difference is going to tell you uh, whether this, this uh, school uh, has really good students or rather bad students. What bad students mean is that their national score, uh, their score in the national test was below uh, 8.03. In this sample, this is the bottom third side. And it seems that there, in, in this, uh, for these students who are in, in let's say, medium uh, cities with internet connections, but in uh, not so good uh, schools, then there is actually no peer quality effect. However, if you perform better, so above the bottom uh, uh, person, this, this effect seems to vanish and has the same as with students with, with two, two towns. I don't want it to infer anything because I, uh, I don't have a sociology uh, you know, uh, degree or something, but I would say that this inverse will investigate what's going on. Uh, just uh, uh, for that, Sarah, I ask you to do what you do not want to do, but it's really uh, strange for me that. Uh, if uh, there is a city, uh, city is larger, so there is three schools, then I think they have others. If uh, the uh, uh, town is smaller than the phone. And uh, from just uh, economic uh, perspectives, uh, how can we interpret this? Or it's just uh, the matter of uh, free building that, uh, you know, it uh, does not remember the theory? So this is this where it comes in that this is data driven. So what is going to give you the better split? Even if this, you know, internet or phone is proxying the same underlying agent variable, uh, it's it's going to decide which is going to give you the better EMC function. On the same line, I think it's this is so this is very uh, dangerous for a job because we I could go too deep into that. You know, you were just really starfish in a way, finding something which is not really there. This is not theory driven, so whilst you're doing the causal inference analysis. So basically you're claiming causal thing and something which there is no theory or no mm -hmm. logical step behind. So I would either, uh, I would probably use some different examples where you can actually explain why or what's going on there because otherwise I can't be here. So you're as well as that. Why would it matter in our Facebook account not being mm -hmm. Word functions. So actually, this, this also shows the limitation as well of, of this method. So of course, it's it's here is data driven. So I think if you are a job dog, you don't talk much about the other. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think uh, I, I would disagree with the. Uh, I would disagree with the uh, Danny because uh, this can give you a good idea what to investigate further. So, uh, I mean. This is just a starting point. So actually, I did a similar research in a vaccine allocation uh, uh, application, and this gave us a very good idea what to investigate later on. 
So, then you have the two months to go. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, actually, I would also uh, claim that this method is really nice for for uh, for you know as a starting point for for discovering something. Uh, of course, I would, as I have told you, that I have I, I wouldn't bet my career on it. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, <laughs> but you are. Right. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah, right. Um, yes. Well, so, so I understand that we are about to be data driven, but does it does it make sense that despite being data driven, I decided that okay, I. I no, so that's 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 also a great question, and uh, this is the part that I shouldn't emphasize too much. But uh, this is the limitation of, of machine learning methods. So, what kind of variables you use is going to uh, you know lead to different results. Uh, uh, and actually, this is well documented that uh, that these three uh, methods are are really uh, fragile and not so robust of, of, of choosing your variable. Of course, these are uh, super relevant and completely orthogonal to the others. Then, then you are safe. So you mentioned uh, at the beginning that you need. I mean, for each of these clips, you need the overlap assumption, right? So you need. Uh, actually, observations around each cutoff, because otherwise you cannot. Yeah. Uh, this is not sorry. This is not the classical overlap, but yes, it's similar. Okay, but first question: How do you know that there so are the procedures which are testing this? So yeah. you know that there is a cutoff on the high scoring uh, and low scoring two schools with internet access in three school towns in a sample of eleven thousand. Actually, it's restricted. So if I don't have enough, you know, observation about the cutoff or below the cutoff, then it cannot run a regression, and this is going to cause some problem. And there are some nice uh, built into, you know, do not make a split which uses less than fifty or hundred observations, uh, and also it also uh, considers the, the number of treatment and not uh, uh, control units. Then you are changing the split value. Great. So, what if what if you don't have this? Uh, then, then you basically you have to drop those uh, that uh, variables, right? So, if, if along one cutoff line you don't have observations that around the cutoff, then you, you cannot equally. So, this is basically the same line of argument that that Anika was saying that you can you can actually and drop uh, that variables either because you don't have enough observations or because you don't think there are people. Well, ten or ten things is not a correct methodological. I put it differently. Uh, putting it, using it because you think they matter by theory. So why would the internet matter, or why would whatever? I decided that the certified teachers not think they matter. Don't think that one. That's right. And then you can also play around with feature engineering. So instead of phone and, and no and internet variable, you create a, for example, a PCA. And and, and, and use the first component and so on. Okay. <laughs> okay, so finally, uh, there are some extensions. Uh, in the paper, I discussed the fuzzy design as well. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, it's even more interesting because what does it mean uh, uh, to be a compiler, a compiler in this uh, in this uh, setup? And there are some future extensions as well. That's okay. Uh, the first and the most interesting part is uh, to use non-parametric estimator. And why? Because if we are using bandwidth selection, for example, then it's not going to be now a special case of the generalized method, but you know completely providing a new tool. And actually, this is fairly simple to, to do, or I hope. Uh, the other one is King Design. Uh, and last, Posal Forest uh, to estimate the, the gate function. And that's going to also accommodate for continuous gate uh, 
functional form. Okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, I would like to, to show or, or provide you an econometric tool uh, to explore heterogeneity of the treatment effects for uh, RDD specifically. Uh, I show how and why this method works, and it's going to result in a simple and easy to interpret uh, model of the tree structure. So that was it. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any further questions, I'm happy to try to answer, please. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, have you considered implementing the tool in SETA? I'm not just asking because I'm lazy, but because that would be another publication for you because the SETA journal has an impact factor. So it might be good for you too. <laughs> <laughs> and the TED assessment. Okay. <laughs> uh, just, just a second, I try to. Or even are. Okay, so yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, I will just be here and if you like us, especially uh, we can go back. So yeah, that's 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 uh, one of the importance that, that I should consider. Um, Stata, uh, I don't think so. I'm not very really familiar with Stata, and I'm not planning to be. Uh, however, of course, you're right. So, uh, but the other side, so yeah. uh, the other one is R, and actually, this is one of the plan to do uh, to do internet in R. However, I, I just have to realize if I would like to do causal first, then I don't have to only uh, learn. Uh, you know, pretty well R, but even better R, but also C++. Because all of these machine learning methods and the core is implemented in C++ uh, because of, of uh, you know, running time consideration, and, and that's a big job. Uh, unfortunately, C++, so, so there is a ten scale, like a bit Python. Any other questions? <laughs> And if not, then thank you very much for the presentation.